just highlighting you, and, and I saw you like in this, um, I'm trying to think, only, almost feel like it was like a Gumby um, material, you know what Gumby's made of, and it was like you were encased in it. And I saw the Lord was, has been in, in the last season of your life removing that case off of you, and, um, and, and that you were getting broken out of this mold that, that you had been in and placed in. And part of it had been the Lord, part of it had been your own decisions, and part of it's just life sucks sometimes, and that's what happens to us, that we get put in this very, very <laughs> professional. Um, you know, you, this, just, this stuff was just closing you in and, and molding you into something that's not what you wanted completely, and part of it was what, who God has called you to be. But I just felt that he was pulling all of that off, and you were stepping into total freedom, you know, and just this whole different um, place where you weren't having to be confined and having to do things a certain way in a certain moment and then to perform, basically, to keep everyone happy, that there was just freedom coming to you to just be a son, you know, just to be a son of the Lord. But then I saw, to this, um, as worship continued to go, I, I saw it wasn't the honey that we were talking about from heaven, but there were, it was a liquid that the Lord was pouring over you. And, and it, he was just um, bringing refreshment to you, but also those places where you're like, God, we got to fix this. God, can, what about this? And he was just kind of remolding those, those places that you've been asking for him to do those things. So anyway, there's just a great grace right now on your life, and I decree that that you have a great grace that you're living in and walking in in this moment. This is a very special, specific moment in life for you. And, and, and the path is really quite broad, and the options are quite large in this moment. And as you make the certain decisions and you, you, you kind of move out of this gumby state that you've felt like you've been stuck in, um, as you start to move, you're going to be like, oh, this is too much space. And the Lord's going to totally show you, because you're going to be able to see and hear him so much more clear. And even though you're like, wait, there's so much, there's so much, you're going to know exactly, because you're going to see and hear him. So you're going to be able to walk right on the path, and it'll begin as you begin to make the options and the choices necessary for your destiny and call to be fulfilled at the next level. Um, the, the path's going to just get a little bit more in tune and, and smaller, and it'll just become like clockwork for you to just, oh, I know what's next. I know the step to take. I know what he's saying to me, and, and it's just going to work. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Because I don't really know you other than your Dwayne's brother. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Um, Blake, I'm sorry. I know that you're it's not your first time to be here, but don't freak out. But I just felt like the Lord wanted me to say to you that by Easter, you're going to see some great changes in your life, and that it's, the Lord is just dealing with you and, and, and loving you on a very gentle level right now, and that there's a real gentleness and peace to you, and that God's given that to you, and that is totally great, That's how, and he's wanting to create more of that within you, but by Easter, you're going to see something totally shift in your life, and um, you're going to have an opportunity to actually... Um, I don't know that it's a major, major shift in life. I don't know that for sure. But what I feel is that by, I just kept hearing, by Easter, by Easter. I don't even know when Easter is. Is that like next week, please? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> sometime in April. Um, by Easter, you're going you're gonna to so see something in your life shift. And it may just be something internally. I don't know for sure. But, um, but just be aware of, of the goodness of God and what he's doing within you and what opportunities come to you between now and Easter. but Because I, I think there's going to be a, a huge paradigm shift in your whole life between now and Easter. Amen? All right. Time's up. Hallelujah. Well, we welcome everybody today, and uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, I ask you to pray for me. Uh, I have one more week of the current class I'm in for my seminary class, and I'm in the middle of writing a paper. I've already written one paper this week, and I get to rewrite this one again apparently this week as well. So it's a fun moment, but um, a lot of, lot of transition, a lot of busyness for many people. But uh, this morning I wanted to, and I, you know, I really like to look at patterns in the Word, okay? And I like to look how God did things, especially in the book of Acts, 
Okay? And so this morning I want to look at the foundation of the, of the church at Jerusalem. Okay? And, uh, you know, you guys know that I've preached a lot about the Antioch church and, and Lord, the Lord said years ago that we were to fashion ourselves after the church at Antioch and Charlie Champ a, a few months ago came in and said, you guys are like the church at Ephesus. And so let's just confuse it more and talk about the church at Jerusalem. <laughs> Amen. But, uh, you know, one thing that's very important, and um, let me just read this very quickly, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. When God does something in the Word the first time and He establishes something, it's very, very important. Amen. And that's a good interpretation. You know, when you're, when you're interpreting Scripture, look at often the, the first time something is mentioned. But in this particular verse, it says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles. Okay? And, and that word first is proton, which means the first in time, the first in place, the first in order, or the first in importance. Okay? And so the church at Jerusalem was a first in time, it was a first in place, it was a first in order, and it was a first in importance. And God established something in the church of Jerusalem that became a pattern. Now, if you continue, we'll, we'll get ahead of ourselves a little bit, a bit here. But if you, one of the reasons that the church of Jerusalem, obviously what, it, what happened in it and through it was very amazing, and God established something However, they did kind of miss it because they didn't go out of Jerusalem. And uh, God actually allowed persecution to come. Isn't that interesting that God allowed persecution to come because they wouldn't move? Yikes. And uh, so persecution came. Um, they, they, a group went and established the church at Antioch. And from there, the world really began to be evangelized. But at the same time, there was, a, there was an importance and an order that God established at the church at Jerusalem, okay? And I want to look at that. And, and the church at, at Jerusalem, we know that it was very apostolic, okay? And uh, that because all 12 of the original apostles, besides Judas, obviously, who was replaced, all 12 of the original apostles were functioning at the church at Jerusalem. So obviously, it was a very, very apostolic church, the apostolic anointing was very, very strong. And so there was a strong apostolic dimension. And, and what did that look like? Okay. And so we're going to look at that. It'll probably, this will probably go over even to next week. As, and we looked, we've looked at these scriptures before, but I want to go a little more in depth and see this is what I believe much of the church should, there should be these dimensions in the church. Amen. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42, and we're going to read through verse 47, and then we're going to break this down and look at this. So, hallelujah. It says, And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Isn't that awesome? When you go to church, you should feel a sense of awe, shouldn't you? Man, did you feel a sense of awe in worship this morning? It was powerful, man. I almost grabbed the mic and, and broke into prophetic song and be glad I didn't. But, um, but everyone kept feeling... <laughs> Some of you might have heard me, but behind me. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Man, that is such a powerful passage of scripture. So I'm going to look at some of these things this morning. And these are components that should be in the church. Amen. Amen. So first of all, and this is for some, this is a terrible word, but doctrine was in the church. There was apostolic doctrine and teaching. Hallelujah. And you know, we should all know good doctrine. 
right? It is so important that we as the body of Christ, we as the average believer should know what Scripture says, right? Uh, we should know what the Bible teaches, right? It's very important because it, it does things like it, it gives us, um, and, and the believers were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. There was a continuing, there was a steadfastness. There was a giving to, to what was being taught. And um, uh, also, you know, we all need good doctrine, yeah. right? Um, and, and, you know, I'm all for messages and sermons that get in the, the nitty-gritty of life. I tried to do that last week, right? Got everybody stirred up. <laughs> Everybody's re-examining their relationships over the week. And those things are important, and, and we should be motivated, and we should be encouraged by Scripture but we also should have good doctrine because there's a lot of um, bad doctrine out there. So I, I, I had to actually, I, I won't get into that. I'll, I'll start, I've had everybody start up this week with one of the books that I'm reading about some of the occult roots of many alternative medicines that were, are involved, and I won't go there. I'll talk to you all about it later. But... Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, apostolic teaching and good doctrine, what does it produce? It produces right belief systems. Okay? Much of our society is in absolute turmoil right now because we are, besides just bad morality, we don't have good doctrine. And what it's producing in our culture in this moment is absolute disarray and confusion. Okay, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I keep wanting to get off and get on stuff, but uh, good doctrine ex establishes strong belief systems. Amen. It also renews the church's corporate belief system, right? And when we understand the word, we know what to expect. When we understand, even, and we'll get into this a little bit, that that healing and the miraculous is good doctrine. In this present day and age, because of the kingdom that is present, we'll have faith and expectation for those things. When we gather, we should expect the miraculous. We should expect God to touch us. We should expect God to, to move in glory and power because good doctrine teaches that that happens. Amen? Amen? And so a lot of us have been taught bad doctrine. Anybody was taught bad doctrine and the doctrine of cessationism? Yeah. I was. I was taught that certain things happened and then they just ended at a certain point, but that's not what Scripture teaches. I mean, so we need good doctrine. Amen? And if you want to talk about doctrines from hell, cessationism is one of them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, you know, it steers believers away from deception when we have good doctrine. And not only that, but when we have good doctrine, when we have sound teaching from the Word, it produces a government and a structure and a wineskin that enables revival in the move of God. Right? Good doctrine will actually enable that. Okay? And good doctrine is more than just teaching. It, 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 there's a teaching element of it. And we've talked about that in the last weeks that really... You change a region by declaring the truth. As you start preaching and declaring, I mean, when Paul went into a region, like when, we hit, when he went into Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he taught the word of the Lord, and over a two-year period, he taught daily, I believe it was in the school of Tyrannus, and it said all of Asia heard the word of the Lord because of Paul's teaching. So teaching and doctrine is extremely important and we need to be devoted to it. It's one of the reasons that we're actually, many of us are doing this Bible app where we're reading through the Bible together. Now, I'm a day or two behind, so y'all don't judge me, okay? I've heard some are months behind, but there's grace. There's grace that empowers you to get her done, right? <laughs> so apostolic doctrine is very, very important. We need more of that in the church. Hallelujah. The next thing, and you know, when we're looking at all this, you know, it says they were continually devoted to the apostles' teaching and doctrine, and they were devoted to fellowship. 
Okay. Now this this means more than a day than a weekly potluck. And I I like weekly potlucks. He does, right? Um, so, but fellowship has a far deeper meaning than just hanging out at the coffee shop. And that's good too, right? I'm all for that. But when you look at fellowship, <coughs> excuse me, I need a drink of this. But um, fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, okay? And it means partnership, it means participation, and it means communion. Amen? Partnership, participation, and communion. And when this dimension is present, it causes strong participation from believers. Okay? Because really, honestly, Christianity and the church, it, it's not supposed to be about just people warming seats. It's supposed to be participation. And so what happens when we quantania together? Okay, what happens when we do that? Now, this is with boundaries, but there's the reality we share in one another's lives. There's an element that we're participating and sharing. We develop real relationships. Because, you know, one of the expressions of the church in Scripture is that um, it's supposed to look like family. Yes, amen. It's supposed to look that way. The church is supposed to look that way. I believe we have a generation right now that's hungry for family. Yes, that's right. And they're tired of the church looking like a business model. Yes. They're hungry for more than that, right? And one of the one of the problems of the church right now is that we've we've created this um, model that's all about consumerism. Right? Yeah. Come and I'll put on a show for you. Yeah. Right? When really what it's about is come and be part of family. Right? right? Commune together. Have real relationship. Have real discipleship. Have, have a real impartation with one another. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that's what I believe many people are hungry for one another. Because in Quantania, we're actually imparting things to one another. Amen. You have gifts and anointings and perspectives that I need. Yeah. Well, we've been doing the healing rooms, and, um, and I, I know how to flow in healing, but I'm just like, okay, I'm going to step back and let others carry the weight of healing in the healing rooms, because I've been busy on the prophetic team too. But there are people in the body that have strong healing gifts like Dusty and Will and Martha that need to, I need what they have in their lives, right? There, when, when, we, when we quantania together, there's something that they're walking in that gets given out. When we come together on Sunday morning, there's something, and when we come together on healing rooms or when we come together in supernatural school, or we come together for treasure hunts, or even when we come together for a fellowship, there's something of our lives that we're sharing together. Yeah. Amen. We need that. And so um, when, we, when we're imparting things to one another, when we fellowship one the, with one another, it's not about what we can receive as much as it's about what we can give. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Real impartation, real fellowship is like, okay, what can I give out today? Right, when we come together in a moment like this, it's like, what can I give today? Amen. And maybe it's greeting people at the back and making them feel welcome. Do you know how important that is? Yeah. Right? I mean, have you ever gone into a church to visit and you didn't feel welcome? Yeah. Or no one talked to you? Or you were there for months before someone knew your name? Or heaven forbid that you sit in Sister Bertha's seat. Yeah. That's happened, right? We used to go to church with this lady that one day we accidentally sat in her seat. She was not happy with us. But you know, we were kind of, for years, but we were kind of glad because she liked to kiss you 
when you were, she was happy with you, but she liked garlic. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. So Now, Mary likes to kiss people, but she has good breath, right? Is that right, Dean? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? So when we're... <laughs> Too much information, right? We're, we're sharing too much, right? But when we're fellowshipping, we're giving things out. Now, I, I want to read this scripture also. So we'll stay in Acts chapter 2. But Philemon, the book of Philemon, which only has one chapter actually, it says, I pray that Paul writing that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. It's so dark up here. I'm having a little trouble reading. Is it dark in here or is it just me? It's true. It's because I am almost 52. So, (laughs) commentary from the front row here. So, according to this verse, it talks about the fellowship of our faith becoming effective. So, our faith needs fellowship in order to grow and develop. Right? We need that. We need the body of Christ. And, you know, there are some people out here who I see them say stuff like, well, the Lord's led me right now to not be a part of a church. I know you don't understand my walk. Well, yeah, because you're not obeying the word. <laughs> That's disobedience. Right? We're supposed to fellowship. We're supposed to be a part of the body. Your kidney cannot survive off by its own. And your body can't survive without kidneys, right? We need that. And our faith actually, it grows and develops through fellowship. So when faith and fellowship unite, the work of the ministry becomes more effective. Amen. Now, another thing about fellowship is that there's this idea of impartation. Amen. Now, I, you guys know part of our culture here is we believe in impartation. When we have supernatural school, when we have a guest instructor come in, I'm like, man, do a time of impartation. Lay your hands on people. Pray for people. I mean, Jamie and I go to global awakening events once or twice a year. And when we're there and they're doing impartation, I'm in line. Whether it's Randy Clark or whoever. I mean, it could be Randy's secretary and I'm in line because of what what they carry, you know, and and there's that thing of of being released. But part of that, when we, certain things can be true, but they get into extremes because of that culture of impartation now, a lot of times it revolves around, well, I'm going to run from conference to conference and get impartation, where true impartation comes from a right relationship, fellowship, and accountability, Right? That's where you get real impartation. Amen? And, uh, you know, even in, in um, 1 Thessalonians, Paul writing in 1 Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica, in v- chapter 2, verse 8, he said, um, We were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Do you know that's what impartation really is? That it's not me just laying hands on you to give you an anointing and to share in with you what I have, which that's a reality of impartation. But real impartation is I'm sharing my life with you. I'm giving you my life. Okay? And, and even Paul, you know, when he talks about impartation and the laying on of hands, and he told Timothy, you know, kindle afresh the spiritual gift which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Right. It's because Paul was a father who, who ordained and commissioned Timothy, but he poured his life into him. That's what real impartation looks like. When I get an impartation prayer, and, you know, Jamie and I ordained years ago, with Global Awakening, and we got an impartation from people like Randy Clark and Bill Johnson and Heidi Baker and others in that moment, and it it wrecked us. 
But it wasn't just because they released something to us. They released our lives and we walk in relationship with them. Because we've aligned with global awakening. Amen. And alignment and authority, those are real things. And because we've aligned with the organization of Global Awakening, who's a part of Revival Alliance and all these ministries coming together, it's more than a temporary laying on of hands. It's an impartation of life. Amen? Amen? And so, you know, the Greek word for impartation means to divide with one another or to have a share in something. Amen? So when we lay hands on a person to pray for them, we are literally fellowshipping with them. We are giving them a share of what we have. And it, it's strongest in the context of relationship with one another. That's why you can't just show up for a special guest okay, and say, I'm going to get something and then go live like a flake for the, rest, the next two months. Nora agrees. She loves her pops. But it's in the context of relationship. We're walking together. And what you carry, I get to share in. Now, that's why you have to be careful who you're walking together with. Right? And some people get all like, oh, don't lay hands on me. Well, you know, there's truth in that. But it's really more about, because if, it's really more about I'm aligning with someone who if, if they're walking in something that's not right and we're sharing our lives together, I, I'm getting some junk. Right? Let no one lay hands on you. Lay hands on no one suddenly. Right? Because that's more about what's the relationship? What does that look like? That's why, you know, you can't just get ordained online. Some people do, right? With no accountability, no character, no relationship, no family, right? That, that's, those are false alignments. Didn't really mean to go this far in my sermon. You know, but we've got such a weird mentality in the body of Christ right now because, again, it goes back to, well, we're not family walking in covenant, in marriage about covenant and commitment and, and, and if you're not walking in covenant but you're just going and getting what you need from certain people at certain times, that's actually more like prostitution. Right. Well, I'm going to go to this conference and have a one-night stand. Oh, my gosh. Now, I, I believe in conferences, you guys. I really do. But, because, yes, I want to go and get impartation and teaching and refreshing and all that thing. But if you can't walk in the local body and do what you've received at that conference, you, 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 really, haven't care, you really didn't get an impartation. Right? Because impartation is about relationship and sharing together and walking together. Amen? Hallelujah. That's good preaching. Boy, I'm, thank, you, thank you, Lord. Yeah, amen. Amen. So, we, we get that. Fellowship is important. Amen. And it revolves around relationship. Praise God. Now, the next thing it talks about here, they were devoted to apostles' teaching, they were devoted to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Amen. I miss bread. <laughs> no. No, my... <laughs> Of course, my kids are making fun of me because they're like, we saw you eating bread yesterday, and I was. I'll have one day where I'm gluten-free, and then three days where I'm not. It's about balance. And it's all about balance, and it doesn't work. <laughs> but, but let me just say, after all that bread last night, it wasn't good. <laughs> but <laughs> TMI, right? We're all family here. <laughs> but you know, some things even family doesn't want to know. <laughs> some things even family doesn't want to know. Right. It's true. 
But breaking of bread, there was communion together. And that goes with that idea of fellowshipping together. But it also has to do with the table of the Lord and communion and the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist or whatever you want to call it. All throughout church history, that has been a key thing that the church observed. And even in the early church, they often built entire prayer services around the table of the Lord. And they would commune together and take the elements and the bread and the wine, or if you're Baptist, the grape juice and the bread. <laughs> and uh, they would do that together. And, and they would spend time praying over one another and, and even praying over needs and praying for society and the culture that they were in because they were wanting to bring a transformation. But the Lord's table was such a key part. And, and not only did they did, and you can even read, and we'll get to this later, but they, they did this in the temple and from house to house. Right? Because some people are like, well, the early church, they, were, they just met in houses. Well, they met in the temple and from house to house. So there is an element of we're coming together as a body together, but in our daily lives also, there's that element of smaller times together and, and maybe even sharing in communion in our daily lives just in our relationship with the Lord. I love, and I, I know Benny Johnson has a new book on communion, and I haven't read it yet, but um, Bill and Benny do communion every day together. And often when they do it, they spend time, and I love this. I probably need to do it. We probably all need to do it. But they, they pray over people, and they actually bless their enemies. Wow. And they pray for some of the ones who are most vocally against them and pray, and they bless their their children and their children's children, and they will serve God and they'll love God. And oh my goodness, is that powerful? You know, people who have old, whole websites and ministries devoted to criticizing them, and they spend time just blessing in communion. It's, uh, it's a powerful thing. So the breaking of bread, they were devoted to this. Amen. They were also devoted to prayer. Hallelujah. And um, boy, prayer meetings were a vital part of the church. Amen. And, um, you know, think about this. The very first outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened after a united all-night prayer meeting. Was that an accident? No, I mean, and, and those who were part of it, they got to experience something. And, you know, we joke about this because... You know, Jesus, from the time of his, his resurrection to his ascension to heaven, over 40 days, he what appeared to about 500 people. But only 120 were in the upper room. Right? There was something that the 120 got to experience because they were devoted to prayer. Right? They were praying, they were expecting, they were present. And you know, I know that we have lives and those things. And, but sometimes we need to be present to really receive what God's doing. And as much as I love things like pod, podcasts and webcasting and all that, there's something about being present for the move of God. Right? So it's so important. So prayer meetings, uh, very, very important. And, um, you know, not only on the day of Pentecost, but if you study awakenings and revivals, and, and, and I, you know, you guys know I like to do those things, and I talk about them a lot. But if you study outpourings since the day of Pentecost, they were all preceded by prayer. Every single one of them. You can't remove prayer from that equation. You know, some people are like, well, you know, Holy Spirit's already been poured out. He's present. Yes, that's true. But if you want to experience that in a greater depth, you have to have prayer and believe for the greater thing. Amen? So every move is preceded by prayer. It was so important to Finney, right? Charles Finney, a great revivalist, 
a great man, um, you know, known for becoming a catalyst for the Second Great Awakening in America, and he had incredible results as long as he had his two intercessors, Daniel Nash and Abel Clary. And they would go before him, and they would go into cities before he came. And a lot of times they'd rent a room, and they'd just lock themselves in the room and, and travail and intercede for the move of God in that region. Right? It was incredibly powerful what God did from them, through them. You guys wake up. Okay? I, know, I know everybody's sleepy. We lost an hour, but don't miss this. Right? Because sometimes the devil will put us to sleep when we, there's a point we need to get. So, hallelujah. Or if you're that tired, it's okay. Go to sleep. Right? I know some of you need it. But, but, but the thing is, it was so powerful what they did that I think, which one was it? It's in my notes. That when, um, when Nash died, when he passed away, suddenly Finney's crusades were no longer effective. And he transitioned his ministry and started pastoring a church and I think opened a Bible college because um, suddenly he wasn't an effective revivalist anymore. Did the season shift or did intercession stop? Sometimes when we think the season's changed, maybe it's because intercession has waned. Well, it's not God's will for this outpouring. Are we missing it? Sometimes we blame things on the will and purpose of God when we've actually walking in disobedience. Well, God will do everything He wants to do. Yeah, but He's waiting on you to pray. He's waiting on me to pray. He's waiting for me to step into the intercessions of Christ and see His desire fulfilled. That's, that's too heavy to preach about, isn't it? Hallelujah. <laughs> Man, I'm convicted. I preach myself into conviction. Right? Another thing that began to happen, they were devoted to all these things and everyone kept feeling this sense of awe. And with awe, there's an element, actually, of fear. There's an element of reverential fear that came on the church. Okay? And, uh, you know, and even if you go over and read probably one of the scariest accounts in the New Testament, Acts chapter 5, I'm sorry, Nora, I didn't mean to scare you. But Acts 5, Acts chapter 5 talks about and I'm not going to go into this in depth because it, it freaks people out. Ananias and Sapphira. Right? And, and they lied to the Holy Spirit about their finances. And they died. Right? And their, their heart was, was filled with deception and deceit. And they dropped dead, and it says, terror gripped the entire church and all others who heard what had happened. <laughs> We've already taken an offering, y'all. Relax. Okay? <laughs> but anytime, a lot of times when you see revival move in a greater dimension in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, um, there's something that happens that actually causes the reverential fear of the Lord to come. Yeah. Acts chapter 8, you know, Philip is preaching in Samaria and people are getting delivered from demons. And, and Simon is like, who, who had been a, a sorcerer, and he's like, man, this is more powerful than what I've been doing. When, and this, he saw this when, they came to, when Peter and John came and prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And whatever happened was so powerful <laughs> that the witches in the region were like, this is greater than anything I've ever seen. And I, I want it, and I'm willing to even pay for it. And, and, and he actually, 
Peter and John, they rebuked Simon. And, 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 and fear came on that region and the revival intensified. If you look in Acts chapter 19 at Ephesus, what have you got? You've got Paul um, seeing uh, in, incredible miracles come and he'd, he'd pray over, where are my handkerchiefs, right? I forgot to hold these in worship, but he'd, he'd pray over handkerchiefs, right? And they'd take them and they'd put them on people's bodies and they'd get healed or demons would come off of them. It was unusual, extraordinary miracles, right? And, uh, and so it was so powerful that the sons of Sceva decided that they would try this deliverance thing. And they tried it in the name of that Jesus that Paul talked about. Because the name of Jesus is more than an incantation. right? And when they tried it, they said the, the demon and that guy jumped on them and beat them up so much that they fled out of the house naked and beat up. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's better than reality TV. It's better than The Bachelor, right? And, um, and it says that the fear of the Lord fell on the region. Now, sometimes we're like, well, there shouldn't be any fear of the Lord, but it says that it caused the revival to actually escalate. And people started coming out of darkness because they saw that Jesus was real and that he could deliver people and he could set them free from bondage, right? from those powers of darkness and fear. Tell you what, holy fear starts coming on, people start getting delivered. One of my favorite stories, some of you guys have heard me talk about it, you know, Mariah Woodworth Etter. And she was, she was preaching, and they'd send, and this is in the, the late 1800s, and they, they'd send Mariah into the hardest places. And here's this elderly lady who could go in where no one could penetrate with the gospel, and she'd go in, and she'd break it open. Right? And one man came to mock her, and his tongue swelled up so big, he couldn't keep it in his mouth or shut his mouth. Wow. Don't mess with women preachers, y'all. <laughs> right? Jamie said, is it okay if I prophesy? And I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I don't want to be like this right now. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna, later, she's going to say, remember? <laughs> She'll say that later today. But that guy, he said, will you pay for me? <laughs> and she said, well, <laughs> you, you need to repent. And he said, well, what about the grace of God? <laughs> and she goes, if you repent, I'll pray for you. And he walked away and he wouldn't let her. And then a day or two later, he came back. <laughs> and he repented, and she prayed for him, and his tongue went back to normal. And I bet he got saved. <laughs> or was it Mariah that people would come to mock the meetings, and they'd go into a trance for days? And, and they'd come out of the trance, and they'd be like, we saw hell, which they didn't even believe in. And they came out of the trance born again because God had taken them into some of those encounters. Right? And even Charlie Champ, when he was here, and I don't know if it was on his, one of his teachings, I think on one of the DVDs, he, he said that a guy came to one of his meetings to mock, and the guy got up and walked outside and dropped dead. And man, he told that story with fear and trembling. He was not excited about it. He was broken because of it. But there was a reverential fear and awe that came on the church. And it, I believe a lot of it was because of the glory that was on, the signs, the wonders, the miracles. And those things, I, I think they were even unusual. Right? People get all bent out of shape 
about a glory cloud that shows up at Bethel Church. Well, that's the devil. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. You know, well, they're just throwing glitter out. Have you ever seen glitter spin for hours in a cloud? And instead of, if you just shoot it out of a vent, it's not going to do that. I had friends that were there that night. And they were just like, it was the most awe-inspiring thing. They said, it built our faith. Okay. And guess what, y'all? The glory cloud is in the Bible. <laughs> you know, and I think there was such awe and there was such wonder happening because of the signs, the wonders, the miracles that were coming forth. Amen. And let's just say some people get all bent out of shape because they're like, well, the devil does signs and wonders. If someone does a sign and wonder and tries to get you to worship somebody besides Jesus, that's probably a counterfeit. Yes. Yes. Didn't the sorcerers in Egypt do that? Yes. Well, you can turn your staff into uh, a snake. We can do it too. And then Moses' staff, which was a snake, swallowed up yeah. theirs. Right? The, the power of God will swallow up the counterfeit of the devil. Right? There, there's both a reality to those things, but a real sign and wonder and miracle, people moving in those things, they will push you to worship Jesus. Not push, but they'll invite you because those things give glory to God. Right? Are there counterfeits? Absolutely. Right? The devil counterfeits what's real. Hallelujah. They, they were experiencing signs and wonders. Everyone kept feeling the sense of awe. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen. And it's so funny because when the, when the early church experienced persecution, they, they prayed for two things. And you can look in this in Acts chapter 4. And I'm, I'm winding down because we're almost at noon. But when the early church in Acts chapter 4 experienced persecution, you know what they did? They said, okay, God, they had a prayer meeting. And they said, Lord, overturn this corrupt government. They didn't do that. I've prayed that sometimes, and I think it's okay to pray that sometimes. Right? But what they prayed for was boldness to continue to preaching the word. Right? And they prayed for the Lord to extend his hand and do more miracles. Lord, keep doing the miracles. We're getting persecuted for it. But Lord, extend your hand. Lord, use us. May we speak the word of God with boldness. And it said the place where they preached was shaken by the power and the presence and the glory of God. That's a good prayer meeting. Right? Don't you like prayer meetings where the place gets shaken by the power of God? It's important. Signs, wonders, and miracles, they begin to produce this powerful thing in the church. Now, one more scripture. Let's look at Acts 4.33. I just referenced it, but let's look at it. Acts 4.33. It says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And, oh wait, I'm in 32. I told you I couldn't see up here. It says, And... And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. Amen. And I, I love that because that, that great power for the miraculous was on them. And the word great actually comes from the Greek word mega, meaning big, right? Obviously. You want a mega church? <coughs> And I'm not just talking in size. I'm talking in power. I think what God's wanting to release is not just size without power so nobody gets offended. But mega grace, mega empowering, amen, that in the church at Jerusalem was characterized by mega power and mega grace. And this is a dimension that's even beyond ordinary miracles. This is an 
Acts 19, church at Ephesus, mega grace, where Paul was doing extraordinary miracles. Amen. May that come and touch us in this place, in this city. So we're going to decree mega grace. Who needs mega grace? Yeah, we need the mega grace to come. Not, not just for our personal lives, and we do need some mega grace right now, right? I, I believe that what I saw in worship, that God was, was setting up some ambushes for some situations and some circumstances in people's life, lives. But there needs to be mega grace that comes to touch our community. Right? Not just so we can say, boy, at Global Harvest, we got it going on. And I'm all for that, right? (laughs) But mega grace upon us that it will draw men, women, children. It'll break the power of sin and deception that's blinding a generation, right? And that God will extend His hand to touch His people with mega grace at this moment, Right? And the, the, the church in Jerusalem, they operated in that. Lord, touch us with mega grace. Amen. And we need all these things. We need that, that apostolic doctrine and devoted to teaching. And we need fellowship. And we need prayer. And I think some of the mega grace was released at a greater level because of the prayer and the intercession. Amen. And those, that awe that came and that fear that came because of the Lord extending His hand to heal. Mega grace was upon them all. Lord, let Your mega grace come upon this place yes. and upon this city. Let's stand together right now. Lord, we just are crying out right now. Father, uh, there, there's more that we're going to look into, but uh, Father, I thank You that... You're wanting to release mega grace right now. Father, you're wanting to release mega power, mega dunamis. Lord, mega signs and wonders, unusual things, extraordinary things, God, that will cause the name of Jesus to be lifted high. Father, we ask that the light of your glory would shine. Lord, that it would shine in this house. It would shine in all the ministries of what we do. But Father... In the temple and from house to house, God, that you would release mega grace. Father, in our homes, in our individual families, God, in our workplaces, Father, as you send us out today, Lord, as we've gathered together to be equipped, to be uh, refreshed, to be empowered, Lord, I ask that as you just send us out today, God, you would send us with mega grace. You would send us with mega empowering, God, to see your grace and your glory release through each one of us. God, release glory. Release the gospel through us this week. Father, may each one of our homes become habitations and dwelling places of your glory, God. And Father, that, uh, that you would draw men, women, children, that they would be drawn because of the mega grace that is upon us and is being released through us. We thank you today. Lord, thank you for that honey, Lord, that many have been sensing. God, there's, there's, there's a revelation, there's a strengthening that you're being released, God. Father, I thank you for the honey of revelation, the honey of strengthening that, that's being released, uh, that heavenly honey in all of our lives. We just receive right now, God, in Jesus' name. We receive, God, what you're releasing. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Mega grace, may it be upon us all, God. Let that mega grace be released, God, more and more and more. God, we thank you. We thank you for what you're pouring out. We thank you for what you're pouring out today. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So just keep receiving. Anybody have problems with a hamstring? Yeah, I don't totally know what it is. I just heard hamstring. So 
I know it's a, like a, what is it, Alan? It's in your... Muscle right here, right? Anybody have a tendon that runs through the muscle? Anybody have an issue with that or have pain in that area? Okay, I may have missed it. So, hallelujah. So if you do have that, come and receive prayer. Amen. Or if you have a need, we're going to have a team here for prophetic ministry. We'll also have a team here for physical prayer and for prayer for physical healing. Amen. So come and receive ministry. And just as we dismiss today, I want you to walk in the mega grace of God, the unusual, extraordinary grace of God today. Amen. All right. Bless you guys. Have a great week. And we'll see you some tomorrow and some we'll see next Sunday. Amen. Bless you guys.